The Glasgow Coma Scale has three components eye opening, verbal response, and motor response. These will be demonstrated in turn. Each of these depends on how the patient responds to either a vocal or painful stimulus, which we will demonstrate. When performing the assessment, the best response should be elicited. Each component should be assessed in a stepwise manner. Start off with assessing the alert patient. If the patient is not alert, then establish his or her response to a vocal stimulus. If there is no response to this, then you will need to perform a painful stimulus and document the response. Only if there is no response to pain is the patient deemed unresponsive. The response to each score should be documented accurately and not simply whether the patient is responsive or unresponsive. Firstly, assess the patient's spontaneous activity. Good morning, sir. I'm Nurse McKenzie. Good morning, Nurse. Hello. Could you tell me a wee bit about what's been happening to you, sir? Yeah, I was leaving the house this morning. I tripped and fell and banged my head. OK, OK. Can you tell me... Here the patient is talking and moving spontaneously. No further stimulus is needed. The individual components of the scale can be assessed with voice alone. Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Okay, thank you, sir. You... If there is no spontaneous activity, you will then need to elicit a response to your voice. Hello, sir, can you hear me? When speaking to the patient, you must ensure that you speak clearly and with volume. Hello, Mr. Murray, can you hear me? Speaking quietly will not necessarily elicit an accurate response to your voice and may of course be a problem if the patient is in any way hard of hearing. Ensure all hearing aids are switched on and working normally. Make sure that you are speaking a language that the patient understands. Where necessary, you should ask a translator to interpret for you and make sure there are no cultural barriers to the patients responding to your voice. For example, in some cultures, female patients should not be examined by male health professionals and may be unwilling to respond in these circumstances. Ideally, you should use the patient's name when you address them. Try to ensure you use the name the patient normally uses, for example, their nickname. Ask any friends or relatives to tell you what name they are known by. In certain circumstances, it may be appropriate to ask a relative or friend to speak to the patient, as they are more likely to respond to a familiar than an unfamiliar voice. Hello, sir, can you hear me? Mr. Murray, can you hear me? If the patient does not respond to a clear vocal stimulus in any of the three components, and there are none of the previously mentioned communication barriers, then you will need to move on to eliciting their response to pain. Mr Murray, I'm just going to press on your fingernail. When you elicit a patient's response to pain, you should start off by applying firm, sustained pressure to the base of the patient's fingernail using a blunt tool such as a pen or pencil. This should be done on the dorsal aspect of the finger, just proximal to the nail bed and not over the nail itself. A painful stimulus may also be performed by applying firm, sustained pressure to the supraorbital notch, which is located in the bony ridge above the eye. Another way of assessing the response to pain is to apply firm, sustained pressure behind the patient's mandible over the styloid process. You may also use your thumb and fingers to apply a trapezius squeeze. You should not elicit pain by rubbing vigorously over the patient's sternum, as this will cause bruising and does not elicit a good motor response. Similarly, you should not shake the patient. Nor should you use any implement that may actually cause damage to soft tissues. So the acceptable ways to elicit pain are pressure to the nail base, pressure over the supraorbital notch, pressure to the styloid process behind the mandible, and a trapezius squeeze. The unacceptable ways are sternal rub, shaking the patient, 
or pain on any other soft tissue area that may cause bruising or damage. Now that you have seen the different techniques that are used to elicit a response from the individual, we shall take the different components of the scale in turn, showing how these are scored. There are three components to be assessed. Eye opening, verbal response and motor response. The eye opening response is scored with a maximum of four and a minimum of one. The verbal response has a maximum of five and a minimum of one. And the motor response has a maximum of six and a minimum of one. You will see that the minimum score for each component of the GCS is one. This is to demonstrate that the component has actually been assessed and so avoids a score of zero. Starting with eye opening, this component of the GCS has a maximum score of four. If a patient's eyes are open spontaneously, then they score four. If a patient only opens their eyes to speech, then they will score three. If a patient only opens their eyes to pain, they score two. And if there is no response, then they score one. In this case, the patient has spontaneous eye opening and scores four. Hello, Mr. Murray. Can you hear me? Here, the score is three, as he only opens his eyes to speech. If the patient only responds to a painful stimulus, he scores two on eye opening. And in this instance, there is no response and therefore a score of one. When assessing eye opening to pain, you should use nail bed pressure, as supraorbital pressure will only cause the patient to grimace. Moving on to verbal response, this has a maximum score of 5. Use the same procedure as described before when assessing the verbal response. A score of 5 is given if the patient is fully orientated in time, person and place. 4 if the patient is confused, which means they are speaking in sentences but disorientated. A score of 3 is given if the patient only has inappropriate words. 2 when there are only incomprehensible sounds, such as moaning and groaning, and 1 indicates no response. Begin by talking to the patient and assessing their response in conversation. To have a score of 5, the patient must be orientated in time, person and place. No, I remember everything. Yes, okay. Sir, can you tell me where you are at the moment? In the hospital. Okay, and do you know what the name of the hospital? Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, can you tell me what day it is today? It's Friday. Okay, and what month is it? September. Okay, and sir, could you tell me your full name, please? John David Murray. Thank you. In this example, the patient has a verbal response of five, as he is fully orientated. He knows where he is, what day and month it is, and his full name. A verbal response of four is given to those patients who are confused. This is characterised by talking in sentences but not being orientated. A great number of patients who have consumed excess alcohol may fall into this category. Hello, sir. I'm Nurse Mackenzie. Hello, Nurse. Hello. Sir, can you tell me what's been happening to you today? Banged my head. Banged your head. Were you knocked out at all, sir? I don't remember. Okay, sir. So do you know where you are at the moment? Hospital. Hospital. Could you tell me the name of the hospital? Um, Victoria Infirmary. The Victoria. Sir, can you tell me what day it is today? Wednesday. And do you know what month it is, sir? I think we're in October now. October. And sir, could you tell me your full name, please? John David Murray. Thank you, Mr Murray. Here is an example of a confused patient who superficially may appear to be orientated, but on direct questioning it becomes apparent that he does not know where he is, neither does he know the correct day or month. Remember, you should accurately record the patient's best response and not what you think the patient should be capable of. This patient will score four on the verbal response. The next example shows a patient who has a verbal response of three. 
Hello, sir. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray, can you tell me what's been happening to Get you? Get off me. Get off me. Kathy. <laughs> Kathy. Mr. Murray, can you tell me what's been happening to you? This Get patient is not only confused, he's only able to form inappropriate words. It may be that he has a lot of alcohol on board, but this is immaterial in assessing his GCS. Some patients who are belligerent, as a consequence of alcohol, drugs, or more sinister causes, will also have a V of 3, as they are responding with inappropriate words. Hello, patients who are unable to form words and can only make incomprehensible sounds, such as moans and groans, have a V of 2. Again, you should look for any impediments such as language barriers or hearing impairment that may prevent the patients responding to your voice. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Mr. Murray, can you hear me? Patients who have no response to either a vocal or painful stimulus are given a V-score of 1. Situations that may cause a problem with assessing the verbal response are where the patient's first language is not the same as that of the assessor, where the patient cannot hear you, as before, where the patient is physically unable to speak from, for example, extensive facial or mandibular injuries, where the patient has dysphasia or aphasia from a stroke, or if the patient has a vocal disorder or has had a laryngectomy. In these situations, you can only assess verbal response by asking the patient, with the help of an interpreter, to use sign language, or they may write down the answers on paper. It is not the vocal apparatus that is being tested here. It is the patient's central language abilities. It should never be assumed that inaccurate responses are simply the effects of alcohol or drugs. The patient's score should be an accurate representation of their response to your stimulus. If it is impossible to test a verbal response in a patient who is intubated in, for example, an intensive care setting, and has no other means of communication, then you should score the verbal response as V with a subscript T. The final aspect of the GCS is the motor score. This has a maximum of 6. A score of 6 is given to a patient who is able to obey commands. 5 if the patient localises to a painful stimulus. 4 if the patient flexes or withdraws from the painful stimulus. 3 if the patient has abnormal flexion. 2 if the patient extends. And 1 indicates no motor response. When assessing the motor score, you should try to do this in concert with the other components, so that when speaking to the patient, you are assessing both eye-opening and verbal response as well. Only patients who are able to obey commands should get a motor score of 6. Mr Murray, can I ask you to touch your nose with your right hand, please? Certainly. Thank you, Mr Murray. If the patient is unable to carry out a complex movement because of some restriction in their arm movement, it is acceptable to ask the patient to squeeze and then release the examiner's fingers. This again would score 6 on the motor component. Mr Murray, can I ask you to squeeze my fingers with your right hand, please? And release. Thank you. If the upper limbs are injured, then it is of course permissible to assess the score using the lower limbs. Mr Murray, can I ask you to push your foot down onto my hand, please? Thank you. If both upper and lower limbs are affected, then it is acceptable to ask the patient to stick out their tongue. Mr Murray, could I ask you to stick your tongue out, please? Thank you. Remember, when assessing the motor response, always ensure the patient's neck is immobilised if there is any risk of cervical spine damage. If the patient can only localise to pain, then this will score 5 on the motor component.
When assessing the motor response to pain, it is often better to use supraorbital notch pressure, as this will give a clear demonstration of limb movements. In some cases, the patient will be unable to localize to the painful stimulus and may withdraw rapidly from the pain if nail bed pressure is applied. This flexion withdrawal may also be accompanied by abduction and external rotation at the shoulder joint, or they will flex and supinate their forearms if pressure is applied to the supraorbital notch. This will score 4 on the motor component. If you find that the patient localizes to pain on one side, but only flexes on the other side, then you should still give the patient a motor score of 5, as this is their best response. Remember the GCS is about assessing the best response in any of its components. An M of 3 is given to those patients who, whether spontaneously or as a response to pain, have an abnormal flexor response. This is seen in significant brain injuries, such as diffuse axonal injury. Abnormal flexion is seen as adduction of the upper limbs, flexion and pronation of the forearms, and flexion of the wrists. If the type of limb flexion is not clear from the patient's response, then you should simply describe their movements rather than assigning a numerical score. An M of 2 is again a very abnormal response on the motor component of the scale and is seen when the patient extends his limbs either as a response to pain or spontaneously. It can be seen that both M2 and M3 are very abnormal and usually indicate significant intracranial injury. Together, these movements are sometimes called posturing movements, which reflect how abnormal they appear. If the patient makes no response whatsoever, they have a score of 1 on the motor component. Clearly, the limitations to assessing the motor score would include when the patient is paralysed, has amputated limbs, or has an injury to the limb that is being assessed, for example a fracture. Again, you have to ensure there is no barrier to the patient's understanding you, for example language or hearing problems and the other foregoing reasons. If it is impossible to assess the motor score on account of there being some impediments to the patients moving their limbs, then, as with voice, you should make this clear on the observation chart.